Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for How to Use Supported Decision Making, a step-by-step -step guide. My name is Viviana Bonilla Lopez, and I'm an Equal Justice Works Fellow sponsored by the Florida Bar Foundation at Disability Rights Florida. I have the honor and privilege of working with people with disabilities every day to help them either avoid a guardianship or get out of a guardianship using supported decision making. So I'm going to talk to you all a little bit about what supported decision making is and how you can actually draft your own supported decision making agreement or if you are an attorney, guide a client through that process. So we'll start by reviewing what supported decision-making is with this video. We all make tons of decisions every day. Some of them are small decisions, like whether or not you should buy that cool new video game or order pizza. Others are bigger, like deciding what kind of career you want, where you want to live, or who to vote for in an election. Everyone has the right to make decisions. Sometimes we need help with those decisions. If you're a young person or an older adult with a disability, your family, medical service provider, or someone else may ask a judge if they can become your guardian and make all of your decisions for you. This is a legal arrangement called full guardianship. Your parent or guardian might think they have to get guardianship to do things like attend IEP meetings, or help you make financial decisions. But that's not true. There are other ways that people can help you make choices. For example, a healthcare proxy only helps make healthcare choices. And a social security representative payee only helps with some financial choices. But another option that lets you keep control of your choices is called supported decision-making. A supported decision-making agreement lays out a plan for you to meet with a person or group of people you trust. These people can be family members, friends, co-workers, or others who can help you make decisions. You pick the decisions you might need help with, who can help, and how. Your group of supporters might look through information with you and talk through the pros and cons of different choices. They might talk with you about eating healthy foods or ways to keep track of appointments. Want to choose a college, vote in elections, or change jobs? What about date, get married, or start a family? With supported decision-making, you are the decision-maker. With guardianship, the guardian is the decision-maker and makes all the final decisions. Some decisions are big, some are small, and all of them are important. Making your own choices can help you lead a happier, healthier life. If you are a person with a disability, and feel like you need help making decisions, know that you have options. You have the right to decide. For more information on supported decision-making in contact at. So this is a really good summary and introduction. We all make what supported decision-making is. And if you wanna learn more about the differences between supported decision-making, guardianship, and another option in Florida that we have called guardian advocacy, I encourage you to watch our video webinar called The Right to Decide, Supported Decision-Making in Florida, where Mike, who you see in this picture, and I go through all of that in detail. And I should actually go ahead and give a description of myself for anybody who's watching this video who's not able to see me. So I am a brown woman. My background is sort of a blank rose colored wall. I'm wearing glasses. I have dark brown hair and I'm wearing a white blazer. So I'll go ahead and describe this slide for you. And it's a picture of Michael Lincoln. Michael Lincoln is a young adult with a developmental disability and he is wearing his security guard uniform. He's a white man with dark brown hair. And Mike is actually a really big deal in supported decision making in Florida. He is the co-chair of the SDM for Florida Coalition, which I'll talk to you all about soon. And he's the first person in Florida to get his rights back using supported decision making and to terminate his guardianship. I really encourage you to watch our first webinar to learn more about his story, because he is the best one at telling it. But I like to share an example of how Mike uses supported decision making. Terrific. So how I use supported decision making is I use it as a chain of command. And that's a picture of my new 
new uh, apartment on my own. It's like half of it, but it's a picture of my new apartment. Um, I had to go down a chain of command because I wanted to go out and live on my own. So I contacted my uncle and I contacted Colleen, which is one of my supports. And I even contacted uh, my representative Peggy, which is Danny. And basically we went out and we looked at a lot of places. And I tell you one thing, I never thought living on your own and finding an apartment would be, be so hard. <laughs> but I was out and this place hit me at home because it was right dip dab in the middle of St. Well, at the end of St. Lucie West. So everything was right there where I needed Publix, Walmart, Winn Dixie, McDonald's. And the money, we had to focus on the money. And they said that the rent was a thousand and it was all included electricity, water, cable, internet. I'm like, yes, let's do it. This is everywhere in the middle of everything I want it. So <laughs> we got a team together had a meeting, we decided, yes, we're doing it. We signed the contract, we read over the lease, we signed the contract, and we put down the first glass of security, and before we know it, I have my own apartment, and it is absolutely amazing. I feel like I'm in luxury heaven, because <laughs> pools I can go swimming in anytime I want. I'm mostly always in the pool, so I'm like a fish, but... <laughs> So that's the home situation. And again, please visit that webinar and learn more about Mike's story told by him. So going from less to most restrictive is the next slide. I always encourage people to try the less restrictive alternative first. And then if that doesn't work, then that's when you would move to mo more restrictive alternatives. This picture has an inverted pyramid a red inverted pyramid. And then in white, we see different tools from the top of the pyramid to the bottom. At the top, we have the option where the person makes their own decisions, supported decision-making, and then it moves down to advanced directives. And advanced directives are a document where you say what you want to happen if you're not able to say yourself in the future. Then we have powers of attorney, which is a document where you can give someone the ability to actually act on your behalf. Then we go down to healthcare surrogate where you can allow someone to make healthcare decisions for you. And these are documents that are changeable, right? I can change my mind and say, you're no longer my power of attorney and where I direct and I still have my rights. So if I don't like what you're doing, I can fire you and they're limited, but they are more restrictive in the sense that I'm giving you more ability to decide for me or to do things for me than if I'm just using supported decision making. Then we move down to representative payee, which is a where someone receives your social security benefits for you and manages them. So make sure that your basic needs are met and then saves the money for you or gives some of the money for you to spend. And then at the very bottom, we have guardian advocacy and guardianship. And there we have permanent and total, right? Because most people who are put under guardianship are going to die under guardianship. It's pretty hard, complicated and expensive to get out. It can be done and we have clients who've been successful, including Mike, but it, it's much more difficult to get out. So below the pyramid, we have an arrow pointing down, less rights, right? So from the top of the pyramid, we have more rights. At the very bottom, we have less, less rights. And then you have an arrow pointing up, more rights. So as we move from bottom to top, we have more rights. So supported decision-making, I'm keeping all my rights and people are giving me advice. And I might be incorporating these other tools, right? So maybe I'm using supported decision-making with my mom. And one of the ways she supports me is by depositing money in my bank account for me because it's hard for me to get to the bank, right? And so in my supported decision-making, I say, mom, I'm giving you this power of attorney to deposit money in my bank account but I don't want you to do that without talking to me first. And then if she violates that, I could always remove the power of attorney. So there's ways to incorporate all these tools into supported decision-making, or you could use each tool on its own. For more about this, watch our other webinar, but I wanted to give everyone a bit of a review. 
So how do I help my clients decide between all of these options, what's going to be the best for them? If you are an attorney, this part is for you. So again, go from less restrictive to most restrictive. And I have a really cool tool that I would love to recommend. It's from the American Bar Association, and it's called the Practical Tool for Lawyers. And it, it's an acronym, right? Practical is an acronym, and then each letter stands for something different. So the first is presume guardianship is not needed. So always start from that assumption that something else is going to work. A lot of times for people with disabilities, the first thing people turn to is guardianship. Oh, they're about to turn 18, they have a, a disability, they need guardianship. That's not the right way to do things. Reason. So clearly identify the reasons for concern. Why, why is this person or their parents or their loved ones coming to me today? What is really going on? Ask if a triggering concern may be caused by temporary reversible conditions. So if someone with a mental health disability is currently in a moment of psychosis, that can pass. That's not necessarily permanent. So let's wait till they get better and then assess the situation of what, what things are going on. Community. Determine if concerns can be addressed by connecting the individual to family or community resources and making accommodations, right? Let's not assume that they're just not able to do it. What's missing? What, how could we help them to address these concerns? Do they need an ASL interpreter in order to communicate? Do they need assistance from a loved one? Team. So ask the person whether they've already developed a team to help them make decisions, right? This is related to supported decision-making. Who are the people who you trust? How do they help you? Are there ways that they could help you and you haven't asked yet? Identify abilities. So identify areas of strengths and limitations in decision-making. You wanna get a good, a good sense of how this person's doing. What are they good at? What's a little harder for them? And then challenges. So screen for and address any potential challenges presented by the identified supports and supporters. So we wanna look into what is going on, what is difficult for them right now, what's the issue that we're, we're trying to address. And then appoint legal supporters or surrogate consistent with a person's values and preferences. So it's really important that we don't impose on other people how we believe that they should live, everybody, should have the dignity of making their own choices about what they want it to look like. So some things that may feel way risky to you and you, you wouldn't want in your own life may be perfectly normal and appropriate for somebody else. And so we have to take those things into consideration and where and when the person is selecting their supporters or people who they're gonna give power, maybe through a power of attorney to make decisions for them, we need to make sure that, that there is um, consistency and a connection there and then the last limit. So limit, if you end up saying, okay, the only thing is guardianship, we really tried everything else. We've been working on this case for some time. And the only thing that's going to work is guardianship. Okay, let's limit that as much as possible, right? With guardianship, there's a ton of different rights that you can lose. And again, please watch our other webinar to learn more about that. But you were talking about the right to vote, the right to decide where you live, the right to marry. And these all require different skills. So we should be evaluating the person's capacity for each right individually and only removing those that the person really absolutely cannot do. But, you know, just because they can't get married doesn't mean they can't vote. Those are different skills and we need to keep that in mind. So the practical tool is much more detailed than what I've gone into and, and it's really great. So I encourage you to go to the American Bar Association's website and download it. We will include a link in the description for this video. The next slide is self-evaluation. And here we have a picture of a person who's wearing a tan shirt, jeans, sneakers, you know, casual, sitting down with their legs crossed and contemplating. They're sort of thoughtful, they're thinking. And then we have behind them a blank white wall and it looks like doodles, right? Like picture of a cat was doodled, a bright window where you can see the sun and the clouds and a plant, a cool chair with a pillow. We have a lamp, a painting of nature, and then a, a set of drawers. So the person's sort of thinking about what are all the possibilities in this room and in my life? And that is what the self-evaluation is all about. This is the first step that I take with any client who we are going to do supported decision-making for or for whom we're going to consider 
supported decision-making, powers of attorney. We're trying to figure out what's going to work for them. So we start with a self-evaluation, which is a process of figuring out what do I want for my life? Who's going to help me to achieve those things? So this is an example of an evaluation that I use pretty regularly. It's from Charting the Life course, and we'll include a link to download this in the description of the video. It's called the Tool for Exploring Decision-Making Supports. For those of you who are not able to see, what it looks like is a chart. And it has the ability to write, you know, who's filling out this form, who's helping me fill out this form. And then the most important is it asks in the first column, a series of questions like, can I decide if or where I want to work? Do I decide if I want to learn something new and how best to go about that? Do I pay my bills on time, like rent, cell, electric, and internet? And then there's three columns to the left, to the right of that, that allow the person to say, I can decide with no extra support. I need support with my decision, or I need someone to decide for me. So I have the person with a disability fill this out. Sometimes we do it together. Sometimes they do it on their own. Sometimes they do it with the people who might be their supporters. And then depending on the answers that we get, we'll have a good idea of what kinds of tools they want to use. So for example, if they write, I need someone to decide for me for a couple of these, that gives me an idea that they're probably going to want a power of attorney for those areas because they're going to want someone else to actually be able to do those things for them. But again, an important part of supported decision-making is maybe I'm going to pass off some healthcare decisions to my mom, but I still want my mom to talk to me about them. I still wanna understand what's going on, why it is that we're coming up to this decision and, and have the chance to, to communicate about it. So it's my choice if I'm making my decisions or if I'm letting other people make the decisions, but I'm involved in my life and making sure that things are going the way I want. So this is a really great tool. I have another tool on this next slide it's pretty similar. This is a tool that I came up with for my clients. Um, some of my clients who I know are not going to want anyone to make decisions for them and want a little bit more detail about how they use support. It's similar to the other tool where it's a column or it's a chart with four columns. The first says health at the top and then it has two questions. The first deciding when I'll go to the doctor or dentist. And then we have a picture of a doctor who appears to be a brown woman with her stethoscope and her lab coat, and she's smiling. And this is for my clients who are pretty visual. So it helps them to think about this question to be able to see a picture. And then making day-to-day -day healthcare decisions. So for example, routine medical appointments and picking up medications at the drugstore. So we have these two questions. And then in the columns to the right, my client will be able to say, I can do it alone or I need support. And then if I need support, what kind of support do I need? And then in that column, I have a section where I give them some ideas. So for example, for healthcare, maybe you want your supporter to accompany you to medical appointments. Maybe I want my supporter to help me understand what the doctor says, or I want my supporter to help me prepare for appointments by making a list of questions for the doctors. So filling this out is going to give us, again, a good idea of what's needed. Maybe after looking at this, I realized, okay, so this client doesn't need a power of attorney, but maybe they could really benefit from a HIPAA release. And that would be an information release where they allow their supporter access to their protected healthcare records. So this should always be the first step. Then the second is choosing your supporters. And actually, I guess those kind of go together because in the process before, when I'm thinking, gee, I would really want someone to help me set up automatic payments for my rent, through that process, I should start to think about, okay, who's gonna help me do that? Oh, it should be my sister because my sister is really good with all this tech stuff and she can help me go online and set that up. So through that process, you want to support the person and figuring out who's going to be helpful for them, who are people that they trust, and really important for supporters and supported decision-making, who are people that believe in them, who see their strengths, and who think that they can accomplish the things that they want to do, and who want to help them. It needs to be people who understand that being a supporter is different from maybe being the parent of a minor, right? You, you're not, you need to let them make mistakes. That's part of the process. You're not there to dictate. You're there to give advice. And then the person decides what they want to do. So this is a really important process. Choosing the right supporters 
is, is a big part of, of what happens to make it successful. And another thing I'll mention here is that sometimes if people with disabilities have been in a pretty restrictive setting, like maybe a group home, they may not have that many relationships in the community. They may not have that many people who immediately could step up and be supporters, but it's important to give space and time for that process to meet people, to make new friends. Maybe there are people who have helped them in the past, maybe their staff who they trust. So it's always important to look at those connections, but also give people the chance to be out there in the community and make those new relationships. Talk about it. So, oh, and actually I should go ahead and describe the image in the, in the previous slide where we're talking about choosing supporters. The image here is some cartoon people who are all helping each other up different stairs and there's sort of nature behind them. It's sort of blue and they're all wearing different colors and everyone's smiling. It's about how we, we help and support each other. The next slide is called Talk About It. And here we have a picture of four cartoon people who are sitting around a table and it looks like there's an iPad or a tablet in the middle and someone's pointing to it. And we can only see the, the faces of the two people um, in front of us. The others, we see the back of their heads and they, they're smiling. So they also have different races and ethnicities. We have uh, darker brown, someone with maybe white skin. And so it's, it's a community of people having a conversation. And that's what we want to encourage. Once we filled out the self-evaluation, once we thought about who can be our supporters, let's sit down and talk about it. What am I going to write in my supported decision-making agreement? How do we want to work together? How often do we want to meet? So maybe I'm sitting down with my mom, my dad, and my sister, who are going to be my supporters, and we're going to figure out, are we going to meet once a week to talk about everything? Am I just going to call my supporters whenever I need help? Would I like to have specific maybe days a week that mom comes to visit me at my apartment to make sure everything's okay? So let's talk about how it's going to work. Here is an important concept and slide and, and tools to keep in mind. So using alternative and augmentative communication. Throughout all of this process, we want to keep in mind how does that person with a disability communicate best? How will this process work best for them? And I don't want you to think that just because someone does not communicate verbally or through more traditional forms of communication, and I said that was sort of air quotes, that they can't use supported decision-making. That is not true. So I'm going to share some tools with you that I have used with some of my clients who are nonverbal and which have worked really well. So I think the important thing when a client comes to you or um, a loved one with a disability and you say, oh man, like they, you know, they, they don't communicate or, or they don't, they don't speak. Okay. But that doesn't mean that they don't communicate, right? There are other ways of communicating and you can ask yourself, well, how do you know when they want something? What do they do? And parents might say, oh, they, they pull it up on their phone and show it to me. Okay, so then that's one of the ways that they're communicating. And how can we translate that into the supported decision-making process? So the first here is a picture of someone holding an iPad. And it looks like an older gentleman. He has graying hair and wrinkly hands. And we can see he's holding a tablet. And it looks like he's written with a stylus. So one of these pens that you use on an iPad, the words, hello. So I have a client actually who communicates with me and by writing on her iPad. So the first time that I met my client, she would just was not super interested in talking to me, um, was mostly silent. And for the first 30 minutes, I was just sort of saying, hey, you know, I use supported decision-making with my clients. This is what it is. Isn't that interesting? And kind of just, just sort of talking, keeping the conversation flowing. And my client was sort of intently watching me. And then eventually I asked a question and mom passed the client the iPad and he wrote out an answer and in full sentences was, was really had a lot, had been paying attention and thinking about what I said and how to follow up questions. And we talked about whether I liked cats or dogs and other things about the supported decision-making process. I like to tell this story because if evaluators and examiners had come in to determine whether or not she had capacity and had just spent 15 minutes with her, my client would have been under guardianship. When my client is 
very much able to say what they do and do not want. So we need to give people the space to communicate the way that's best for them and not make assumptions. So this is just one example, right? Maybe writing on the iPad, maybe writing on a piece of paper if they're not as tech savvy. On this slide, we have a picture of a person who has short black hair and is wearing a white t-shirt, but they're, they're facing backwards so we can't see their face. And then someone else with longer hair who appears to be communicating with them. And that second person is holding up a piece of paper that has different letters. So A, B, C, D, E, and they're not in order of the alphabet, but it looks like it's all the letters in the alphabet. And then the first person with the short hair is pointing to the letter I. So this is one way that some people who are nonverbal communicate by pointing to different letters and then those spell words, and that's how they communicate. So this is just one example of a way of communicating. I'm gonna show you some tools that I have used with my clients, and these are augmentative and alternative communication tools. These are recommended to me by a good friend who's a speech and language pathologist. And I would like to share them with you. I think the best tool, especially for attorneys, is to talk to the person's speech and language therapist because AAC tools may not work for everyone. And there is a process to sort of evaluate what's going to work for the person. And their speech and language therapist may already be working with them on something, may already have some ideas for you. But this could be a cool way. And I've used it with some clients who they don't rely on AAC, but this was a way for me to confirm and have kind of double certainty that we were on the same page and we were talking about the same thing. So the first is called Seaboard and it's a choice board where basically it's different pictures and then on the bottom, a description of that picture. So for example, we have a picture that says mom decides and it's a picture of a mom wearing a pink hijab and a pink shirt cradling their baby, right? And so if my client picks that one, I know that they want mom to make that decision. We have a picture that says, write check. And then the picture is of someone writing a check. So depending on what my client selects, I know that we're talking about the same thing. So I might pull up this chart and tell my client, Okay, let's talk about education. Can you pick that one? And my client will go in and pick the picture of a black person with glasses who's at the front of the class teaching, right? Who looks like a teacher and it says education on the bottom. So they'll pick that one and then I'll know, okay, we're talking about the same thing. And then, you know, I might say, well, who, who do you want to make your education decision? And maybe they'll, they'll click mom, mom decides. And I'll say, oh, you want your mom? They might say yes, they might say no, but we know we're talking about the same thing. So I'll show you a little video of how this tool actually works. So you can see it in practice. And I will link to this tool at the bottom of the description for this video. Sign a contract. I want support. Yes. Donating organs. Mom decides. Yes. Choosing classes. I want support. Yes. Driving. So you can see in this video here that when the client selects the pictures, then you also hear written out or spoken what they've selected. So there's like a second layer of confirmation. And then at the top of the screen, you can see each of their selections all written out. So it, it forms sort of a sentence and you can take a picture of that and remember you know, what it is that your client said they wanted help with or not. And again, it doesn't have to be your client. You could be a parent or a loved one doing this with, with a person with a disability for whom you will be the supporter and they will be the decision maker. I also noticed that I never gave you guys my pronouns. I use she, her pronouns. And let's go to the next tool. So 
The next tool is a picture of an app called Verbal Me. And this you can download on your phone or on your iPad. It has the, the logo, which is sort of someone clicking on, on a big button that says hi. And then you see a big button that's green, has a check mark and says yes. And a big button that's red has an X and says no. So this is what the app looks like. And it's another app where the person is able to select and speak through the app. So maybe they won't tell you verbally what they want, but they'll be able to select it in an iPad. And during the pandemic, I've used Seaboard, the one I showed you before a lot, because I allow my clients to share their screen and make selections and all see what they're selecting. But in person, these other tools, I can bring my iPad and do it with the client in person. So here's a video of how verbal me works. Yes. No. Health. Clothes. Money. Friends. I can do it alone. I want support. I want someone to decide for me. So this tool is pretty cool because it just gives options for the person to communicate with you and you can customize it. So you can make the button say whatever you want. And this is what, what I have done where when you heard the thing, the options spoken, there's a big button that has that written out. So I tend to combine verbal me with the next app that I'm going to show you called visuals to go and visuals to go is more similar to Seaboard where it's a choice board that has pictures and terms and you can customize it and then allow the person to select. So if I'm meeting someone in person, I might have visuals to go on my iPad and maybe the other one on my iPhone and allow them to select pictures, and then also tell me what they think about it. So it sort of depends on the person. And the visuals to go app slide just has a picture of the, the visuals to go logo, which is sort of a, a jean jacket type pocket. And then it has different cards in it. And the card in the front has a person with short hair sort of speaking. And then you see a picture of what the actual app looks like where there are different sort of decks of cards and they each have a picture in front of them, like places. And it has a person looking at earth and then one that says toys and it has a little box of toys. So here's an example of how I might use visuals to go. Activities. Brush my teeth. Support services. Get married. Job. Feelings. Tired. Bored. So this is a pretty cool tool because as you saw, there's also options for my client to tell me kind of how they're feeling. If they're like, this is really boring. I would rather not do this right now. Um, we can do that through this app. I also will note that it's important to tailor the pictures and the options to the person. So in these examples, you see that I've used a lot of cartoons and it's because some of my clients really enjoy that, right? Those are things that they like and that they enjoy but don't make an assumption that, right, just because someone has a disability that they're going to be interested in things like cartoons, right? They are adults and they have adult interests. So really tailor it to the person. The, the picture that I, the examples that I've shown you, I've also tried to use images that are representative of different cultures, different races. So for example, the picture of, for marriage is to um, people who are wearing bride's dresses. So, you know, potentially two brides who are getting married. And I think that that's important to make sure that you in every stage of this process are honoring your clients and their multiple identities and the multiple identities they may have that they haven't disclosed to you. And so that's also something to keep in mind with this process. 
So now we're moving on to drafting the agreement. We've worked together for some time. We've talked about who the supporters are going to be. We've talked about what support we want. We've confirmed that this is what the person wants. Now we're going to sit down and write it. So not everybody who has a supported decision-making agreement is going to write the supported decision-making agreement or want to formalize it. For example, I use supported decision-making more informally. Whenever I need to make medical choices, I talk to my parents and they give me advice. But Mike has a written supported decision-making agreement and most of my clients choose to write it down. It can be really helpful to write it down because you can share it with people that you trust, maybe your doctor who you've seen for many years or your therapist, and you can give them an example and a way for them to see how you work with your supporters. So it's a document that I think can be really helpful also for boundaries, especially for those clients who are 19, 20, and are in that process where they're trying to also teach mom and dad a little bit that I'm an adult now and I make my own decisions. And so part of what we have in the supported decision-making agreement are boundaries. It's, it's what I want, how I want to be supported and how I don't want it. It can be helpful to have that in writing. So how will we draft this out and what are we gonna put in it? I have the first slide, alternatives to guardianship, and I'm gonna summarize some of the things that we talked about earlier. I'm really not gonna go into them again, but I'm gonna put them up on the screen. So for those of you who are not able to see, it says supported decision-making, power of attorney, healthcare surrogate designation, advanced directives, information releases, and representative payee. So what are the things that I'm gonna incorporate into my supported decision-making agreement? Is it gonna be a supported decision-making agreement that references the information releases? So the HIPAA release that I gave my mom so she can talk to the doctor? Or is it gonna be a supported decision-making that doesn't make use of any other tools? It's up to me. On the slide, I have a picture for power of attorney that has a person with gray hair, who's wearing green earrings, glasses, a tank top, and it says principal. And they are the person who's giving authority. So I, the, if I'm the principal, I'm photocopying my rights and I'm giving a copy to someone else. So I keep them, I can still say yes or no, but I'm letting someone else who we call the agent. And in this case, it's a pretty cool um, person who is black and has red hair and a cool yellow shirt who also has a green check mark because I've shared my rights with them. Maybe this is my aunt. And so I've shared my rights with my aunt. I can exercise my rights. She can exercise my rights. But if I don't like what my aunt is doing, what I say goes. That's how powers of attorney work. And that's the picture that I have up here on the slide. So those are pretty cool to incorporate. SDM agreements. I have a sample SDM agreement here for you that I'll share in a moment. But before that, I wanted to go over what do we usually put in them? So if in Florida, we end up getting the supported decision-making bill that we are trying to pass, and I'll tell you more about that in a moment, then that bill will say specifically what needs to be in an agreement. But generally, for now, you wanna make sure that these are unique and tailored to each decision maker. So again, that they work for that person. They, it shouldn't be a one size fits all process. And the essential elements I would say are, you wanna say who the supporters are. You wanna say the areas where the support is needed and wanted. You wanna say how the support's gonna be given and whether the supporters will be authorized to act on behalf of the decision maker using another legal document like a power of attorney. So here I might say, mom is my supporter. She's helping me with finances. She's helping me with housing. She's helping me with education. She is going to help me by talking to me once a week about everything that I have going on. And yes, I'm going to authorize her in a power of attorney so that she can help me buy and sell my home. So I'm going to give her authorization to do that. And I'm going to summarize how that's all going to work in my supported decision-making agreement. And again, we wanna make sure that it works for that person. So I'm gonna show you some examples of supported decision-making agreements. And the first one is detailed and it incorporates durable powers of attorney, which I'm calling DPOAs. So here's a picture. And this is taken from the sample supported decision-making agreement that's going to be in the SDM bill, when? And I say what, because we are confident and excited and hoping that it will happen. When it passes in Florida, this is kind of an early draft of what it might look like. So 
There's a lot of text here, but I'm going to highlight some for you. At the top, it says supported decision-making agreement of, and that person's name would go there. Then we have date of birth, where they live, and I've highlighted in yellow, and I'm going to read to you some important text. So my supporters will also serve as my agents, attorneys in fact, and are authorized to exercise powers on my behalf only as expressly granted in the attached durable power of attorney. So like I told you, this is an agreement where it acknowledges that there's something else out there that will give my supporter additional authority. And I'm referencing that. And then another highlighted portion says, I'm stating in this agreement what kind of help each of my supporters will give me and which powers I will delegate to them to exercise on my behalf as my agents. And then underlined, unless expressly authorized to do so in a separate legal document, a supporter appointed under this agreement does not make decisions for me. So that's really important. Whoever picks this up needs to understand that this is about how I'm getting help and assistance not about someone making decisions for me. And actually in the supported decision-making bill that was introduced in the 2021 legislative session, which we hope to introduce again in 2022, the only authority that you can give a supporter under a supported decision-making agreement would be to help you communicate your decisions and to have access to your records. So anything else where I'm actually gonna have someone do things for me, we're gonna go ahead and take advantage of the tools that have been in law in Florida working pretty well for many, many years, like healthcare surrogate designations and powers of attorney. So as you see, this one incorporates those tools. The next section or the next page of the supported decision-making agreement says supporters and powers granted to supporter. I list who my supporter is, their name, their address, their phone number, and then what are they gonna help me with? So here they're helping me with things like making choices about food and clothing making choices about where I work, making choices about my education. And then this is pretty cool. We have a declaration of the supporter. This is something that we are putting into the bill that each supported decision-making agreement would have. And that is a requirement for the supporter to say, I understand that what I'm doing here is not making decisions for the person that I'm giving advice. And I understand that if I do something bad to them, that there are legal consequences for that. So I'll read you some of the highlighted portions. I know that I may exercise only the authority expressly granted to me in this agreement. So did they give me access to their information or not? I'm not gonna do anything that I wasn't given permission to do. And then I understand that chapter 825 of the Florida statutes makes it a crime to commit acts of abuse, neglect, or exploitation against a person with a disability, and that the penalty for doing so may include fines and prison time. There's also portions in here about how I'm going to give the person support. And so this is just an acknowledgement that everybody understands how, how this is going to go. And again, the intent of our bill with having a draft supported decision making agreement is not to say that it has to look exactly like this, that there are essential elements that you need to include in yours. And one of them is going to be this declaration. And then the rest you can go ahead and tailor to what works for you. And how might I do that? I will give you an example with sample SDMA, and that's the abbreviation for supported decision making agreement. Number two, this one uses more simple language and pictures. So we have here supported decision-making agreement of, and then there is a little bit less text and there's more uh, space, right? There's more white space. And then the, the language is a little more simple. So it says the people who will help me are my supporters. I am the decision-maker. I'm saying the same thing, just in a, in a different way. And then unless I ask them to, my supporters do not make decisions for me. I need my supporters to help me make decisions about, and he gives the options to check different boxes. The first one says, taking care of my financial affairs like banking, and it has a picture of two manicured hands looking at a phone, a clipboard, there's a credit card, there's a calculator, there's cash, there's a cup of coffee, there's a USB, there's glasses, looks like someone's budgeting. Right. And so that picture helps me understand, oh, taking care of my financial affairs. Right. OK, cool. So it, it helps to understand and clarify what that means a little more to have a visual example of it. So on this slide, we have a few more options of types of support that the decision maker could receive from their support. And we're also incorporating visual images here. 
So the first option is my healthcare, including large decisions like whether to get a surgery or take a pill and small decisions like what to eat. The first image that we see is cartoons and it's a brown skinned boy with cool hair. It's sort of gelled and slick to the side, brown hair. And then we have a physician above who also has brown skin and red hair and is dressed completely in gloves and the surgical outfit with those glasses that sort of zoom in and you see all the equipment around. So it really looks like a surgery. And that image together with the written description can help me say, okay, surgery, this is what that would look like. Yeah, I, I do want help with that. So it can help sort of reinforce what's written if it's a client for whom visual images are beneficial. The next picture that we see is of a person who is dressed in a green shirt, they're white, they have short hair, and they're contemplating eating either a bowl of fruit with bananas and oranges or a bowl with muffins and donuts. The next option that a person could select is help with personal care, including my personal hygiene and coordinating support services like a chef, driver, or companion. And the first picture that we see is of a black person who has a blue toothbrush and they're smiling. I guess they're not smiling. They have their, their mouth open and they're brushing their teeth and they're wearing a towel over their hair. So maybe they just got out of the shower and it's supposed to show personal hygiene. The next picture is of two white people. One of them is wearing a pink shirt and jeans and is sitting on a bed and the other person is assisting them with transferring over to a wheelchair. So it's a visual interpretation of support services. And you'll notice that a lot of the times I describe these pictures as person because I do not always know their gender and don't wanna make assumptions about their gender just based on what they look like. So that is the nature of stock photos. <laughs> so here we have the next slide. Using supported decision-making, with other options. So SDM and powers of attorney, this is one option that I see pretty often that my clients tend to do. And I gave you an example of what a supported decision-making agreement might look like if it references powers of attorney. But maybe, like I gave the example before, maybe I want my mom to help me sell my house. And so in addition to being my supporter for housing and giving me advice about how much to sell the house for, and um, whether to sell the house and where I wanna live next, they're also gonna be able to sign and actually sign a contract and sell the house for me because I've signed this power of attorney giving them that permission. So you may wanna have this combo of SDM and powers of attorney if you wanna authorize a supporter to act on the decision maker's behalf. Each supporter is different. So this is not going to be necessary for everyone using supported decision making and it's not something we should um, expect or force people to do it's just if it's what they want and i think it's really important to note too that just because i have a power of attorney where i've decided that i'm going to let someone else make a decision for me in an area of my life doesn't mean that i don't have capacity right we authorize others to act for us all the time whether or not we have a disability Plenty of people have financial advisors who manage their investments and, you know, buy stock from Tesla or Disney for them. And, and that's perfectly fine. It's perfectly normal. And so with or without a disability, you can authorize someone else to act on your behalf. And it doesn't mean that you don't have capacity, it just means that's how you want to do things. <laughs> SDM and guardianship. So this is one where I think we should be pretty thoughtful. So <clears throat> SDM can be a really great tool to use in a guardianship to help someone regain capacity and to help them restore their rights, right? So maybe we draft up a supported decision-making agreement and then start implementing it and allowing the person to make their own decisions. And maybe the guardian is stepping into a supporter role. And then we figure out, hey, this works great. We definitely don't need this guardianship. We go to the judge and say, listen, using supported decision-making this is how they've been making their decisions. Let's go ahead and, aim and end this guardianship. This is a strategy that we've used a couple of times. One of the cases is Tyler Borjas's case. He actually had been using supported decision-making informally for years with his, with his mom and his sisters. And then we were able to show the judge, listen, 
here's all this evidence about how he's making his own decisions with support, he should get his rights back and the judge agreed. And you can read about Tyler's story in the Miami Herald because he made the front page twice, first when he filed his case and then when he got his rights back. So I will say that I won't necessarily say that SDM and guardianship is a, a best practice or the best way to do things. I mean, you, you want to try SDM on its own first and guardianship is always last resort. But if it's absolutely necessary to have a guardianship, SDM could be a good way to make sure that the person still has as much control as possible. And I would really encourage that. Alaska is a state where people under guardianship can use SDM and they did it for that reason that there were a lot of people in Alaska under guardianship and they didn't wanna keep them from this tool. The draft that we're making, the, the bill in Florida that we're proposing allows for the same, but it does require a change in relationship, right? Being a guardian, I make all decisions for the other person and even though Florida law does require the guardian to consider what the person wants and to honor that and whenever possible, in practice, guardians usually just kind of make the choice they think is best and don't really communicate with the person. So it's going to require a shift. Being a supporter is different. And it's going to require the person under guardianship to be allowed to make mistakes, right? They need to be able to make mistakes learn from those mistakes. And as a supporter, it is your role to help them understand, okay, what went wrong here? What do we do different next time? And how do we fix this? And we talk about that concept of the dignity of risk in the other webinar that I keep referencing. SDM for Florida. This is our campaign to pass a supported decision-making law in Florida. And I've been previewing this for you throughout the presentation but this is the moment to tell you a little bit more about what we're doing and how you can join us. So the picture that we have up here is our banner. It's purple, it has white letters, and then it has an image of two black women who are embracing each other. They're smiling. One of them has glasses and a red lip. The other one also has a red lip and eyeshadow, curly hair, really cool earrings. And they look at ease. They look happy. We're assuming one's a supporter, one's a decision maker. At least that's what we're hoping that they will represent. And then in bold white letters, we have, I decide with the support of people I trust. Support an SDM law for Florida. And then our website, www.idecideflorida.org. We have a coalition called SDM for Florida that is led by me and Michael together. So Mike, uh, who I shared his story earlier, is my co-chair and I am his co-chair and we work together to lead this coalition that is really led by people who've been impacted by the guardianship system. So it was important to us that our bill really reflect what actually works in practice and addresses the concerns of people who've been through it. So we have 12 different advocacy organizations. We also have self-advocates, so people with disabilities who are advocating for themselves and their community. We have parents of people with disabilities. One of the organizations in our coalition have served as guardians before, so we have that perspective as well. But we're always trying to bring more people to the table. So if you're watching this presentation and thinking, this is really cool, I have thoughts and opinions, please reach out to us on the website. We would love to hear from you. It's really important to us that this be an initiative that is led by the community and we can always do better and improve in that regard. We wanna be intersectional, we wanna be thoughtful. So hold us accountable to that and reach out. So here is my contact information. Thank you guys so much for walking through this process with me. I hope that you are excited about using supported decision-making, that it sounds like something that might be right for you. If you have more questions about some of the legal technical side of things, again, watch that first webinar hear about Mike's story, how he got out of guardianship, how he uses SDM. And then this is more of the practical to do. How do I actually put this into practice? So my name is Viviana Bonita Lopez. My email is VivianaBL at disabilityrightsflorida.org. And my name is V-I-V-I-A-N-A. -A, and then B is in boy L. So Viviana BL, disabilityrightsflorida.org. And then my cell phone is 954 483-5918. It's 954-483-5918. I've also put up in this red box here, the information for Disability Rights Florida, and their phone number is 
800-342-0823. That is our main helpline. So we should tell you who we are, Disability Rights Florida. We are the protection and advocacy agency for the state of Florida. So that means that we receive funds from the federal government to represent people with disabilities. So pretty much anything you can think of where you are having a legal issue because of your disability, we want to help. So please call us to this main line if you have a question about anything other than guardianship and supported decision making. And if you have questions about guardianship and supported decision making, go ahead and use my cell phone. I also put up our website, disabilityrightsflorida.org. We really do offer a lot of amazing services. My colleagues are wonderful. And so please contact us if you would like any assistance. Thank you so much for coming to this presentation. I hope you learned a lot. If you have questions, reach out. We are here for you. And congratulations for going on the supported decision-making journey. I'm so excited for all of you decision-makers out there who are protecting your rights, who are expressing your independence, and who have wonderful people around you who support you and believe in you. So have a great day. And thank you so much. Bye.